A great pleasure to welcome you to the Martin Center Food for Thought. It's Tuesday lunchtime and speak about Russia, Putin's Russia, and uh, their link, its links to Western uh, far right parties in Europe. in Europe and different institutes. We have also, Partei Center has also published recently studies about that. But of course, the political dimension, very importantly. And more and more during the last couple of years, we have been reading from media news about the cooperation of Russia, especially with the parties of very far right here in Europe. We have very uh, concrete cases, concrete examples. Starting from the cover of the book we are going to discuss today, uh, uh, French uh, Front National has both the very concrete uh, political cooperation, but also in very practical. based uh, bank, first, uh, first 11 million and 27 mil million euros, and part of that dynamics, we did see that the candidate of the presidential election then uh, went to Moscow also to meet uh, Putin. Luckily, the, the, uh, Le Pen didn't end up as the president of France. Following the other big countries in Germany, case of Germany, we have Alternative to Deutschland, who, who, which, which party rejects any claims for any practical or financial connections. However, they are very strongly promoting pro-Russian views, considering uh, sanctions morally unacceptable. And but also in concretely, in run-up of uh, before federal elections, they were. According to media information, various meetings between uh, Russian actors and after actors to see what could be done in run-up to in the run-up to election in order to promote uh, the to victorious position in in Dutch in related to Freedoms Party, we see very clear declarations of builders promising to tackle the Russophobia. In, uh, in Europe, in Austria, we see FPÖ, which is currently in government, as, which are already labeled as Putin's friends in Austria. Again, or, or uh, all claims about financial links are, are, are denied, but nevertheless, according to media information, immediately after uh, presidential elections, there were delegations to Moscow, and five years cooperation agreement with Putin's United Russia Party was signed. And also, as a last example, Greece, Golden Dawn, and independent Greeks parties. Golden Dawn, which is very, it's a fascist party, but has very close links to the um, ideologues of uh, which are close to to Kremlin. Alexander Dugin, who is currently in these days traveling in, in Firom, a country next to Greece, promoting the ideas uh, of corruption of European Union and NATO, and uh, promoting Euro-Asianism uh, as ideology. And also independent Greeks, which, which have a formal cooperation agreement with, uh, uh, with the United Russia. Today we are going to focus on, on a book of, uh, of Russia and the Western far right, Tango Noir, as we have labeled uh, Anton Shekhovtsov's book. And in his book, he will underline exactly what are the ideological drivers 
motivational drivers in, of this cooperation of Russia and far-right parties, but also what are, how this functions in a practical level and uh, what are the forms of cooperation and what, what is there for far-right in Europe and what, what is there for Russia. And, and of course, the past and the future aspect of this, because this cooperation is not very, uh, it's not recent, but in fact, it goes back since the uh, 90s. So, sizing the audience, uh, we see it's a very interesting and popular topic. I also like to welcome our online viewers. And so with that, it's quite obvious that this discussion is not uh, it's not uh, it's it's uh, online discussion, so everything what we has been will be said here. We will be uh, streamed to the uh, internet universe. I would like to thank the panelists for coming, and I would like to give the floor to Anna Nalivaiko, who is our very relevant team member, especially dealing with uh, Ukraine, but also Russia related. Issue and Anna will introduce the speakers and will moderate the debate. Anna, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Tommy, for your introduction. My name is Anna Nalivaiko and I'm project assistant here at Martin Center. And uh, I would like to welcome you all to our Food for Thought today. Uh, without any delay, I will introduce our excellent panel. To my right, we have Anton Shekhovtso, who is the leading expert in uh, Russian political warfare against the West and visiting fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Austria, as well as, of course, author of Russia and the Western Far Right, Tango Noir. Uh, on the other side, we have Georgi Shofling, member of European Parliament from the Hungarian party Fidesz, uh, part of the EPP political family. And last but not least, of course, Anthony Sklapsis, who is uh, um, academic I'm a coordinator at the Center of European and International Political Economy and uh, Governance at the University of Peloponnese and visiting, uh, former visiting fellow at the Martin Center. So, uh, Anton, let me turn to you first. Uh, in your book, you, as Tommy already mentioned, you retrace the connections between the uh, Russian government and the Western far-right parties since the 90s. And those links have been established by Russian ultranationalists such as Dugin, Zhirinovsky, and Glaziev. However, we have to wait until 2008 to see a great increase of contact between the two actors, which have peaked in 2014 and are lasting up till today. So what has changed in 2008 and what is the reason behind the increase of those contacts? <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, Anna, for uh, the question. But first of all, I would like to thank uh, Martin Center for inviting me, for having a possibility to discuss the book here, and I'm, I'm grateful for my discussions. Uh, well, let me start uh, from the 90s, although I must say that uh, the relations between the European far right or say the Western far right and Russia, they, are, they did not start in the 90s. Uh, even during the Cold War, even before the war, there was an interest on the, on the side of, the so of Soviet Russia to cooperate with particular forces in, in, in Germany uh, that was slowly becoming a national state. So it was before the 1930, uh, 1933. Uh, but let me let me start with the 90s for 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 this matter uh, after the fall of the soviet union in 1991 russia opened itself to many western influences and many western politicians and many western ideologies one of those ideologies was was fascism it was different <coughs> different uh, forms of right wing extremism and people from 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 the west they started traveling to Russia, to post-Soviet Russia, to have discussions, to have debates with their counterparts, with the Russian ultranationalists. Also, Russian ultranationalists started to travel freely uh, to the West and have the same debates in the West, in France, in Belgium, in Germany, uh, in Italy. And at that time, Russian actors, they were not representing uh, the Russian authorities. They were in the opposition to Boris Yeltsin's rule, Boris Yeltsin, uh, the, the president of Russia in the 90s, before Putin. And they were, the, Russian, the Russian counterparts, they were all against the Yeltsin. And initially, 
uh, well, in the 90s, there wasn't even this uh, movement that was called Red-Brown Alliance that united Russian fascists with Russian communists, who both rejected uh, Boris Yeltsin's quite weak attempts to democratize and modernize Russia, but anyway. So they were really in, in the opposition. It started to change, and it, it kept the same way, I would say, that uh, these contacts between Russian actors and the, and the far right in, in Europe especially, they were very marginal, even during the first presidential term of Mr. Putin. Uh, why and why in the 90s they were marginal and why during this first presidential term they were marginal is because in the 90s Russia still positioned itself as a democratizing state. Also uh, during the first presidential term of Putin, uh, Putin really enjoyed the honeymoon with the West. Uh, the Western leaders still believed that Putin was going to modernize Russia, to democratize Russia. So that was during the, 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 the first term. The first term ended both in terms of, well, the electoral cycle, but also in terms of Russia's own approach or Putin's regime approach towards the West. It ended in 2004. And that was, that period coincided with a series of color revolutions in the post-Soviet space. In Georgia in 2003, in Ukraine 2004 and in Kyrgyzstan in 2005. Putin's regime, um, him personally, but also the ruling elites, they considered the, these series of color revolutions as first. These color revolutions, they thought, were all orchestrated by the West and especially by the US. Two, uh, those color revolutions aimed at repeating a color revolution in Russia itself. So it was sort of practice, as they thought, of the Western forces to bring about a regime change in Russia itself. And third, they, the Kremlin considered uh, this series of color revolutions as the West breaking up the, the contract, as they imagined, between the Kremlin and the West. So in, in Putin's view, in, Pu in, in view of the Russian ruling elites, the contract was that Russia was the, West, the, the, the partner of the West. And they had this idea that Russia could be uh, considered by the West as our bastard. Like he's a bastard, Russia is a bastard, but he's the, 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 our bastard. He's the, Russia is on our side. But the Kremlin considered this uh, color revolution as something... Uh, that was going against this particular contract. And this was the time when Russian ruling elites started to move in a very anti-Western direction. <clears throat> uh, many people who were marginal in the 90s, including those people who made contacts with the uh, European far right in the 90s and, and, and early in 2000s, they became part of the mainstream. They started, they started to... Well, they, they became much more visible in the state-controlled media. The entire, entire system started to change. It became more anti-Western, anti-American. It was not about the Russian society that became anti-Western and uh, anti-American, but it was about the Kremlin, the regime, and the ruling elites. They became much more suspicious of the Western policies. And the first institutionalized form of cooperation was formed already then, in 2004-2005. I mean cooperation between Russian actors that are close, they are, that are not part of the opposition to Putin's dream, but they consider to be part of this system and the European far right. So that was about electoral observation. Uh, the Kremlin realized that color revolutions could be sparked by uh, reports of the OSCE, or the, or the electoral monitoring mission of the European Union. Who would say that elections were not particularly fair, that they could be fraudulent, etc., etc. So those revolutions, which were not really revolutions, but very successful uh, protests against electoral fraud, they could bring people to the streets and they can do trouble for the regime. So the idea was to somehow relativize the reports on electoral observation uh, done by established 
and uh, established and respected institutions such as such as the OEC to contrast these reports with uh, very biased, very um, I would say uh, loyal to the Kremlin NGOs. And increasingly, uh, while well, those NGOs appeared, they could be called Gongos. Uh, Gongo is a government organized non government organization. Um, and people who were taking part in those electoral observations, a lot of them were coming from the far right, from the European far right parties and organizations. So that was the first change, 2004 2005. That was a very important period. And since you mentioned 2008, there was another very important period, and uh, that was the, the war in, in Georgia. Uh, when Russia attacked Georgia in, in 2008, in August 2008, the problem for the Kremlin was that they feared that they could win the war easily in five days. They almost took Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia. They occupied uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. What they feared is that they they failed they failed to convince the 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 foreign media and the and, and, and Western societies that the actions of Russia were justified, and this was the period when the, they decided to reorganize to reconceptualize the Russian uh, state-controlled uh, international media, such as Russia Today. Russia Today, which was founded in 2005. Uh, it was a it was a instrument of Russia's soft power. Nothing bad was really not, there was nothing bad about uh, uh, Russia today at that time. It all started to change in 2000, 2000, uh, 2008 2009. They in 2009 they uh, renamed Russia Today into RT in order to show that the TV station was no longer about Russia but it would also be about coverage and reports of some other countries. And re they reconceptualize it in a way that if first they try, Russia today was trying to persuade or uh, to show an attractive image of Russia, RT started in a very different way. It was going to show that the West is bad, that the West does not understand Russia, and there are many problems in the West. So that became um, uh, the, the major narrative of RT. And of course, they needed Western experts or so-called Western experts. Uh, and they would, in start, they would start to invite people because the problem was, so who is able to come to RT and start talking about how the West is bad or how liberalism is not working or how multiculturalism is not working? And of course, they found those people who would do that on the on the far right. They they found uh, these Western commentators uh, coming from right wing extremist parties, um, fascist parties, radical right wing parties. They would also find them in the far left parties, in the isolationist circles, among the conspiracy theorists. So that was that became a second institutionalized form of cooperation between. Russian actors and, and the Western far right, but we can discuss other forms a bit later. Okay, thank you very much, Anton, for that kickoff. And uh, Antonis, let me turn to you with a follow-up question. The far-right parties are very well known for the criticism of the EU, their pro-Russian leanings, and their admiration of, of Mr. Putin. And it did, the 2014 European elections, they uh, did manage to increase their electoral power. So if we look at the national elections across Europe, the recent ones, and especially the latest one being in Italy, where 50% of the votes went to Eurosceptic parties, um, do you envisage the same scenario for the 2018 European elections. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me here. It is a pleasure and an honor. Um, concerning your question, uh, well, we, we observe a, a wave of Euroscepticism uh, sweeping across uh, European countries. Uh, so we had the same phenomenon in the latest uh, Italian elections, but we also have similar phenomena in other European countries in the European elections uh, per se. Uh, the way I see it, I think that um, uh, pro-Russian uh, parties, especially pro-Russian far-right parties across Europe, will continue to, uh, to be a menace to, to European political affairs. 
Uh, first of all, because uh, they will continue their pro-Russian leanings. First of all, because they have uh, there is a common ideological basis uh, between uh, far-right European parties and uh, Putin's Russia. I think that the far-right politicians across Europe are attracted by Putin's ultra-conservative and semi-authoritarian form of governance. Uh, they see him as an ideal anti-liberal, anti-democratic, uh, anti-European uh, political leader. And um, they are willing to follow his example if they have the chance. Uh, they see his model of government as fitting their beliefs. And they perceive him as a dynamic response to the malice of liberalism and to the openness and tolerance uh, from, which, from which, according to their opinion, Western democracies uh, suffer. So Putin is anti-gay, he's anti-liberal, and so on. Uh, secondly, I think that they see Russia as a geopolitical alternative. They want uh, the disassociation of the European Union, if possible. Uh, they want their countries to exit the European Union or the Eurozone. And uh, in some cases, they also want the, to see the destruction of NATO. So um, by not hiding this, their Eurosceptic Euro and anti-NATO feelings, uh, they also do not hide their pro-Russian uh, leanings, which come natural to them. Uh, for them, European integration um, and US intervention in, Europe, in European defense um, is not welcome. So from this point of view, the restoration of uh, Russian power is perceived as something as not uh, is not perceived uh, is not perceived as a threat, but rather as a desirable development for the promotion of their own uh, uh, political objectives, for the dissolution of the European Union and uh, for dismantling uh, NATO. Um, some might argue that, for example, uh, the offensive um, moves of Putin in the international arena might cause some sort of apprehension to European far-right parties. I'm talking, for example, about the, the moves he made in, in Crimea, uh, previously in Georgia, and so on. On the contrary, for at least for some of the far-right European parties, these offensive moves were perceived not as threats, but rather as windows of opportunity. Uh, for example, if you believe, if, if there, are part, there are parties who have secessionist uh, tendencies, who want to, uh, for example, Jobbik in Hungary, who believe that uh, they should occupy territories from their neighbors. So um, from their point of view, uh, Putin's um, international policy uh, maybe creates um, a, pre a precedent for the promotion of their own uh, political aims. Um, what, it, what is also true is that the, the, the success of far-right political parties in European elections, as you rightly mentioned, um, creates also a window of opportunity for Russia itself. Uh, in, from my point of view, Putin wants to use some of these far-right parties as Trojan horses in order to create problems to the European Union and to its member states uh, themselves, and wants to... Um, to gain some political advantages from the uh, uh, from the activities of these far right parties, I will just give one example. Uh, in September 2014, the European Parliament was discussing the association agreement of, of Ukraine. Uh, this agreement was uh, voted by the vast majority of uh, of the European Parliament, uh, but there were also 120 or 130 something like that votes against the agreement. If you look, up, if you look at which parties voted against the agreement, you will be amazed to find out that the vast majority uh, were far-right parties like Jobbik, like FPO from Austria, like Lega Nord, uh, like Golden Dawn from Greece, uh, and so on. So this gives a new perspective to the, to the way uh, far-right political parties might offer uh, advantages to um, to Putin's uh, Russia. Uh, from my point of view, and this will be my last remark to your question, I think that um, far-right parties will continue to have some sort of electoral success, not only in, na in uh, national elections, but also in, Euro in the forthcoming uh, European elections. This is a trend that has to do with the, 
uh, with Euroscepticism, which is obvious in most European countries. Um, the real question is how can we deal with the problem and how can we make sure that um, we keep Europe, the European Union in the right track? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Anthony. It's just maybe a very brief follow-up question on that. So what do you think is the end game then for both sides? So for is the end game of Russia that of lifting sanctions at the moment or that of really undermining the European value and democracy? And what is the end game for the far right in having this contact with Russia? If you can briefly comment on that. Yeah. I do not think that they can, um, that Russia can achieve uh, uh, lifting up the sanctions just by having a close relations with uh, far-right parties. What, they try, what they're trying to do, from my point of view, is to uh, create problems to the European Union itself and maybe create the opportunity for uh, dismantling the European Union or at least make it, make it, make it harder for the European Union to work uh, from the inside. <coughs> All right, thank you very much. And now a point of view from the European Parliament. Uh, Mr. Schaffling, the Russian disinformation, which is perceived as a threat, has been discussed in the European Parliament in, generally, uh, in January earlier this year, following a resolution uh, of 2016, which called for EU Strategic Communication Task Force, which is assigned with countering fake news and propaganda, to become an official uh, unit of the European External Action Service. So my question to you would be, is Russia Europe's biggest threat and is it Russian propaganda that is undermining um, European values in democracy? Thank you. The Martin Center for this invitation. My congratulations to Anton. It's always a wonderful moment when you've written a book to have it in your hand and then have a book launch <coughs> so I can, I've been there so I can absolutely empathize. Now, Anna, to your question, what is the greatest danger to Europe? Well, I'm going to be very unorthodox, but then you expect that if you invite me. <laughs> it's Europe itself which is the great danger to Europe. You see, what I see as having happened uh, is a, a liberal closure, a clo an epistemological closure, a very tight set of ideas, a monopoly claim over democracy, and the dismissal of challenges as populism. You, will, may not, you may not have seen that. I thought this is fascinating. <coughs> Salvini is saying, I am proud to be a populist. That's the first time I've ever seen a leading politician saying, yes, you've been calling me populist, you regard this as negative, but actually I'm proud of it. Now that I think is a turnaround. Uh, well, there have been many turnarounds and I've lived through quite a few of them. So I think we're, what we're seeing is this liberal closure, this epistemological closure, which obviously has political and cultural and sociological implications, um, is under challenge. And crucially, and this is where I will come on to Russia in a minute, um, the problem, the central problem that I see is that this liberal closure excludes about two thirds of society. It may, it may be smaller, it may be greater. If the only way in which you can be democratic is by being liberal, and this liberalism, by the way, has nothing to do with, with Tocqueville or John Stuart Mill or even Isaiah Berlin, but is a very narrowly dis, uh, defined liberalism, then a growing proportion of society doesn't want to be a part of it. Uh, and the particular tragedy is that this liberalism has become so closely associated with European integration, because it means that if you want to criticize it, you immediately become a Eurosceptic. I'm not a Hungarian MEP for nothing. Um, so, what I want to add here, and this ties in with what uh, you've been hearing, is that the critique of liberalism is not, maybe it is no longer, uh, argued by the far right or the far left. And here, by the way, I'm honest, I was there when the Ukraine Association thing was voted. You left out the far left, mm -hmm. which also walked out. The far right walked out first, and then the far left walked out. So it, it was the two extremes. Um, many years ago, when I was still a, a new MEP, one of the French MEPs sitting behind me on some particular occasion said, les extremes se touchent, the extremes meet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they did. Uh, but I think that's an important point. It's not just the far right, it's also it's the far left that's deeply involved. So what I'm suggesting is that Russia noticed, obviously, uh, this growing dissatisfaction 
with the liberal order uh, around which Europe is structured, and it's doing its level best to disrupt it. Well, why is it doing it? Because that's how power works. It's doing its level best to enhance, enlarge, extend its power. All systems of power do this, by the way. I mean, I'm, I could, we could spend happy hours discussing theories of power. Um, so I would say the critique of liberalism and Russian activity are conceptually separate, but one is taking advantage of the other, except perhaps in one thing. Um, Reference was made to the early years, uh, post-1991 made uh, years, and it seems to me that then there was a clear liberal attempt to do a takeover bid, to convert Russia into a liberal de democratic society, which for many Russians, I think, was a semi-colonial project. Uh, deeply shocking if you are coming from an imperial country yourself. Uh, I've spent much time living in an imperial country. Um, now, where I, I mean, I do agree with you that there is a real danger, uh, which I think is actually, we all agree on this. It's dangerous, Russian activity is dangerous because it has resonance, because the integration project, the idea of what Europe is, has lost some, perhaps too much, of its legitimacy and purposiveness. Why do we integrate? I think it's increasingly difficult to get an answer to which the bulk of population subscribes. I see the, uh, the central function of European integration, but you're absolutely free to disagree with me, is conflict resolution, dealing with the problems of asymmetric power in Europe, preventing centre-peripheric conditions. It's not been very good. If you look at, center, look at Europe from the perspective of centre-periphery, and I come from the semi-periphery, as I think you realize, then you realize that actually these peripheries are structured by the activities of the Commission. Um, I don't know if any of you saw uh, Piketty's blog very recently, who showed the quantity of capital leaving the V4 is actually exceeding what the V4 receive in transfers from the European Union. This is pretty shocking. Um, Again, uh, this is not uniquely Hungarian. There was a, a general sense 20 odd years ago, we're going to catch up. Not a single country from the EU 11, the former communist countries, has caught up. So don't be surprised there is resentment. And some of that resentment, of course, is paralleled by what you see uh, in the parties that you've been mostly discussing. I would add here that, again, it's fascinating. Russia is making trouble on the cheap. If you think about it, um, cyber warfare, uh, dis disinformation, dead yeza, um, subventions, soft power, they are much cheaper than conventional military warfare. And Russia may not be doing terribly well economically, I think we can all agree on this, but it can certainly afford to, to do what it is doing, simply because you don't need that many people to run a troll factory. Um, and you've got the talent. Um, yes, occasionally I mean, they will do wet jobs as they seem to have done in London, but again, it's much cheaper than building 10,000 um, T-74s. Uh, so you, you get my point. Russia is able to do this because actually of the vulnerability of Western society. I think it would be much more difficult for Russia to do this kind of campaign, let's say in China, for all sorts of reasons. Um, I would also add here that I have a certain sense, you may disagree with me, that what Russia is doing is claiming equivalence. If the West is allowed to run civil society in uh, Russia or in indeed the, the so-called near abroad, then why can't Russia do the same thing in the West? I mean, I do see a structural, I want to stress this word, a structural equivalence between what Moscow is doing and what Soros is doing. Money coming in to achieve certain political objectives. We may approve of one and disapprove of the other, but structurally, they're the same. Um, it's the democracy agenda. And then you have you know, the Russian de-democracy agenda, if you like. I'm not sure what to call it, troublemaking agenda. I would add here, by the way, the energy weapon. Um, the, the former communist countries, almost without exception, are very dependent on Russian energy. And the difficulty of getting the US and the West to wake up to this dependence has really been quite unbelievable. 
Look at the way in which the European Union has neglected the, the interconnectors, the north-south interconnectors uh, in Central Europe. You know, we're still not there. Nobody is saying to the Croats, please hurry up and build this LNG terminal in Kirk, which you absolutely need. Nothing. Uh, it was first mooted in 2007, 2008. Anyway, we're 10 years on, and as far as I'm aware, uh, nothing has been done in Kirk. I think they know roughly where it's going to happen. So in that sense, uh, the dependence, the energy dependence of Central Europe, Slovakia is 100% dependent. I think Bulgaria is pretty close to that. Hungary is about 80%, but we're diminishing that with, because there's, there's a big oil, uh, gas field in the, in the Black Sea and so on. But all the same, I think the, the problem lies. And the West has neglected this. Uh, Russia, of course, said, wonderful, here's an opportunity, let's move in. Um, I would add, oh, and by the way, what about North Stream? Central Europe is not allowed to have energy, energy relations with Russia, but Germany is, or how do we argue this one? Uh, is, there, is there a contradiction? Um, North Stream 2 I have in my North Stream 1 was bad enough. Uh, but still, let's go on. Um, basically, uh, Russia wants great power status on the cheap. And I think actually has very little to offer that is positive. And I see the greatest danger not so, see so significant dangers in Central Europe and Western Europe, but the greatest dangers in Southeastern Europe. Why? You know, the so called Western Balkans. Why? Because the EU has neglected this. Um, speaking for myself, the EPP had a meeting in Albufera in 2014, um, and there were, it was in the text, no more enlargements until after 19. And those of us from a little nearer the uh, Southeast European space said, this is completely crazy. It creates a gap. And who will move into it? Russia. And they ignored us. Um, and even now, Juncker is talking about enlargement in 25. I mean, the Hungarian, official Hungarian position is Montenegro is ready to join now. Uh, at least Montenegro has got into NATO. But as long as that space is left basically open to Russian influence, Russia will move in. Don't be surprised. It's as much our neglect as it is uh, Russia's offensive capability. So let me end on this. Um, Europe and the European Union will have to make up its mind. Do we want an exclusively Jacobin type liberal Europe or one that actually corresponds to the aspirations of the majority? It's only if we have the latter that Europe will be able to withstand whatever Russia is doing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for that insight. Uh, before opening uh, the floor to the audience, I would like to direct to two other speakers the question, uh, something that uh, Amy Bishopling said. So is Russia claiming equivalence? Do you agree with that, Anton? I do agree that uh, Russia is claiming this moral equivalence or structural equivalence, uh, but I would disagree that this equivalent does really exist. Uh, the problem, well, the, the, the contrast between what Russia is doing and what the West is doing, or not the West, but Western institutions, let's say NGOs. NGOs are uh, working in Russia, uh, which worked in Russia. They were quite transparent while the Russian operations in the West are usually covered. They are secretive. Uh, we don't know, for example, uh, whether uh, Russian institutions are funding political parties. We know about one case, about the Front National in France, that was not really funding, that was a bank loan. Uh, actually, Front National has to repay this loan. There was even a uh, 6% interest, as far as I remember. But we don't know how it, how it helps, probably helps other parties, uh, political parties, political organizations. What we, <clears throat> what we also don't know, and, the, well, and this, this problem is also connected to a huge issue, which is very often overlooked. It's money laundering. It's a huge amount of Russian money, dirty Russian money, being laundered by a European institution, the Western institutions. And the West, and here I would agree with, uh, with uh, Mr. Shoplin, uh, with the argument about that 
the West itself creates sometimes those weaknesses, those vulnerabilities that Russia is using. The West was completely ignoring money laundering operations of Russian, of dirty Russian money uh, in the 90s and, and, and in, in, in the noughties as well. And I, I would not be surprised if, uh, if investigations such as uh, the one that appeared last year on the Russian laundromat uh, or in Panama Papers that would reveal that all those, all those money laundering operations are also uh, providing opportunities and providing financial assistance to the organization, political organizations that are destabilizing the West, destabilizing liberal dem democracy, destabilizing the, the social consensus in the West. So I would not I do, again, just I do agree that Russia is claiming this structural equivalence, but it, this, this equivalence it just simply does not exist. Thank you, Anton. Antonis, do you have anything to add to that? I agree with uh, most of the things that Anton said. Uh, in my point of view, one of the most crucial things is whether uh, such funding, funding from Russia to uh, European political parties exist. It is uh, difficult to prove it. There are some hints that there are actually there is actually some sort of under the table funding, uh, and to the extent that this funding is illegal, it is a, a big issue. Um, I think that probably there are some um, uh, political uh, there are some economic connections between the Kremlin and European far right part far right parties, which at the same time make uh, uh, these uh, political parties dependent on Russia and in the long term they, they might define further uh, their pro-Russian uh, leanings. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. Yes, of uh, course. A couple, couple of things here. I think we disagree on the meaning of structural. I mean, I don't disagree with what uh, Anton was saying, that Western NGOs they're not quite as transparent as they pretend, and I can tell you stories about this, but Russian money is clearly very opaque, and I, I would accept this, but I, don't, I see structural as having a different meaning. What I would, would add here is, as far as the money laundering is concerned, I think it's London, uh, and that goes on to this very day. Huge amounts of money is wandering about uh, in the city. Um, and don't forget the enablers. The, those who launder money make it possible for a very large number of people to have employment as accountants, as PR people, um, as people dealing with uh, transfers, and indeed, I suppose, the very builders who are rebuilding parts of London out of Russian money. And I think that creates a stratum of people with an interest in maintaining, shall we say, a warm relationship with Russia. Thank you very much for providing us food for thought for a broader discussion. I would now uh, like to open uh, the floor to the audience. Please state your name and organization when asking a question. Comments are also allowed as long as they're short and to the point. And if you're addressing a specific speaker, please say so at the beginning of your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrei Lavrinik from Ukrainian National News Agency, Ukraine Forum. I would like to ask a question to Mr. Shekhovtsov. Uh, Mr. Shekhovtsov, uh, as, as you know, now you raise the uh, issue concerning the possible so-called European observation uh, mission in Crimea at the so-called presidential election of Russia. So could you at this stage describe a preliminary composition of such international uh, mission of uh, European so-called monitors, observers, uh, who will be engaged by Kremlin to, co to co come illegally in the occupied Crimea territory and to observe how Putin will vote for uh, himself. I think you will collect a few questions before giving the floor back to the panel. We have a gentleman in the back. Is this, is this on? Yes, it is. Uh, Jakob Semmer, a European Union official, speaking in my personal capacity. Mr. Schöpflin, you very rightly mentioned uh, Nord Stream 2. 
uh, I'd add another very worrisome example, that of the uh, nuclear power plant deal done by the Hungarian government. Um, looking at both of those done by, or at least <laughs> with the support of um, center-right mainstream governments in, in, in big member states in the European Union, how will those um, facilitate or impede Russia's financing, promoting, feeding the extreme right across the EU. Um, these deals can be seen as legitimizing Russia's interests in Europe and the far right's discourse. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? No, at the moment that we're giving uh, the floor back to you, to the panel. Antonio, will you address the first question? Yeah, electoral observation. So essentially, um, uh, Russia is now trying to invite as many observers, international observers as possible, in addition to the international missions such as the uh, uh, European Union and the OAC and its uh, Office uh, on Democracy and, and, and Human Rights. Uh, they are trying well, to do what uh, some other Russian organization have been doing since 2005, 2006, to have a pool of loyal observers who would say that everything was fine and everything went well. Uh, now, um, in, in contrast to some, some previous years, now they have this issue with Crimea. Uh, the uh, parliamentary, uh, parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe is not going to, to Crimea. The OEC is not going to Crimea to observe the presidential elections there, which is understandable. Crimea is part of Ukraine, international, uh, according to the international law, according to the Ukrainian laws. So Crimea being not part of Russia, it's, it's, it's not a territory where the OEC or the European Union would observe elections. But still, they need international observers who would do this job. And now, uh, several organizations, I would name just a few of them, that's the uh, uh, Moscow-based Civic Control Association, led by Alexander Brod, and also the Russian Peace Foundation, led by Leonid Slutsky, who is, coincidentally, is also the head of the um, uh, foreign Affairs Committee in the Russian Parliament uh, who are trying to uh, find those observers. And they cooperate with some European organizations, with some Western organizations, but also in, uh, in some other countries in order to supply these loyal observers uh, to Crimea and Russia in general. Um, these organizations, these Russian organizations, uh, they cooperate uh, with the Federal Council of the Russian Federation uh, and they cooperate with the Russian, Russian State Duma, the Russian Parliament. And uh, now around 300 of invitations have been sent uh, to, to, to potential loyal observers. Uh, they would bring them to, to Russia, but some would go to Crimea. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Russian Central Electoral Committee does not, does not publish uh, lists of electoral observers as it is done in some other uh, countries, even in the post-Soviet space, so we don't know who exactly is going. Uh, there were confirmations, uh, at least on Facebook, that uh, Andreas Maurer, um, uh, um, a politician from the German far-left party, De Linke, is going, and he's going to Crimea. There were some uh, other uh, confirmations as well, but we have 300-plus people who have been invited, but we know only uh, a very few who has confirmed that they're going. So more information will be available after the elections. Thank you very much. Mr. Schöpfling, would you like to address the question on the nuclear plant? Yes, thank you very much. Um, so basically, the question is about the building of the nuclear power station in Hungary, in Baksh, and whether 
uh, this in any way will impede or accelerate Russian financing of the extreme right and thereby legitimizing uh, Russia. Well, this needs a bit of history. Uh, negotiations on the building of the Pox nuclear power station, Pox 2, started, I would say, in about 2010, 2011. Possibly there were earlier negotiations uh, in the previous government, so before 2010. The fundamental argument is that Pox 1, built uh, during the communist period with Russian, Soviet, Russian technology, and then the question is, does it need enlarging? The Hungarian government decided yes. Should it be done still with Russian technology or with Western technology? And the, the Hungarian technical people looked at it and said, the, the marrying of Rosatom with Westinghouse really has dangers of it. So Westinghouse also came along and offered to build. Um, Rosatom offered quite unbelievably favorable terms. I think it's 3.75% interest or something like that. All this happened, and I want to stress this, before the Crimea. In other words, the international environment was quite benign. Indeed, Hungary was encouraged to uh, diversify its uh, energy sources, notably from Washington. Uh, I don't know whether there was any encouragement from Brussels. Um, I happen to be neutral on the issue of nuclear power. I know that there are people who, notably in Austria, who are very hostile. Austria, as you will know, has just attacked uh, the building of Pox 2. We will see what happens to that. Note too, by the way, and this stuff is, whenever anybody raises Pox, they always forget about Rosatom building in Finland. I wonder why that is. Perhaps one of you can tell me. Finland is far away, remote. They speak a language even more remote and difficult than Hungarian. You know, we are distantly related um, linguistically. Uh, but I really don't understand it. But perhaps one of you can tell me. Um, and finally, ex legitimizing the extreme right. Well, if you follow Hungarian politics closely, you will see that your big is Fidesz's sworn enemy. Read some of the stuff that Fidesz publishes. Unfortunately, it's all in Hungarian, which is pretty impenetrable. Um, and currently, and I don't know whether this gets through it in the Western press, Fidesz, I'm sorry, Jobbik and the left is trying to put together an anti-Fidesz alliance. Now, it's fascinating that the Western left has not said, this is intolerable, we've denounced you because of fascist or fascistoid party. You can now get together with it for an electoral alliance. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, this is a kind of Molotov Ribbentrop uh, in Hungary. In other words, extreme far left and far right get together, les extremes et touche, um, and nobody seems troubled by it. Uh, electoral advantage or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I would say that uh, the money that Jobbik has received from Moscow, and we know there have been some transfers, um, is in a way hostile to the Fidesz government. And to tar the two with the same brush, I think, is uh, really rather misleading. Yes, Anton, would you like to comment on that? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to comment on, on the last argument of Mr. Shoplin. Um, uh, Jobbik indeed was uh, very much pro-Kremlin uh, party for many years. I would uh, relate this uh, pro-Kremlin orientation with the, uh, with the figure of Bela Kovac, uh, member of the European Parliament who lived in, in Russia for many years, who was um, who probably is still married to uh, uh, originally a Russian woman. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, so Jobbik indeed was engaged in pro-Kremlin <coughs> efforts for many years. But um, now I would say, well, first, probably Jobbik is no longer can be uh, can no longer be qualified as a far-right party. Uh, for three years now, it has been developing in the center-right direction. They want to moderate, they want to de-radicalize. And there are very good examples of the genuine de-radicalization de of far-right parties. That is the case of Italy in the 90s. There were 
parties that uh, the uh, de-radicalized, moderated, and became center-right. Uh, there are uh, also examples from the Scandinavian countries where parties that we would qualify as political scientists, uh, as, as far-right or radical right-wing, that move to the center-right. So Jobbik, for three years now, it has been moving to the center-right. And I would say that uh, many, they still have uh, much to do. They still have to get rid of some people who are very uh, radical, but the leadership has moved to the center right, and this is also uh, this I think is very important. Uh, another point is that uh, their pro Kremlinness has also waned during during these years. Uh, in 2014, in 2015. But especially in 2014, they were traveling to Moscow, uh, Jobbik's leadership, and uh, they didn't really found any interest from, from the Kremlin side in cooperation with Jobbik. The Kremlin was not interested, and together with this turn away from far-right ideology and trying to de-radicalize, Jobbik also started to de-Kremlinize uh, their own ideology. The last time, the last time that Jobbik was engaged in clearly pro-Kremlin efforts was 2015. Uh, in 2016, there was also some developments that could be considered as pro-Kremlin. But if we look at the vote in the European Parliament on the resolution about granting Ukraine a visa-free regime that was in March last year, we would see that uh, one of Jobbik's uh, MEPs abstained, Kristina Marvai abstained, and the other Jobbik's MEP voted for granting Ukraine the visa-free regime. That was not expected of Jobbik, which always voted against resolutions that would be either critical of Russia or pro-Ukrainian. So this change in Jobbik, it is quite remarkable and we should not ignore this. I have to respond to this, yeah, maybe but, but I'm not going, I don't want to start to a very audience. long debate on Jobbik. Um, I accept there's been an attempt at de-radicalization. To what extent it's rhetorical, to what extent it's real, we will see. Um, there is a very good Hungarian word for this, almost untranslatable, tukishodash, um, a charm offensive. Uh, I think a lot of this is rhetorical. Um, and. Also, Jobbik can't afford to go too far to the center for fear of losing its radical voters. We will see the outcome on the 8th of April, uh, and, but it, they may lose some of their radical voters who will shift back to the, the left, which is where they got them from in the first place. Um, I accept that Volnar himself, uh, he's the leader, has tried to move the party in towards the center. He'd exhausted his, his radical uh, constituency. Um, and, well, we don't know, I mean, Kovács Béla, he's known in Hungary as KG Béla. Uh, he's, it's unclear what his status is within Jobbik at this time. I find it very difficult to accept the proposition that they've completely de-Kremlinized themselves. Yes, brief comment, and then we'll go A back to the A brief comment audience. on Jobbik and uh, it's a uh, pro-Russian leanings. I, I think that it, at least to some extent, and at least to some uh, point, um, Jobbik was uh, pro-Russian, especially in the case of Ukraine and Crimea, because of its um, territorial expansion, expansion, expansionism. I remember, for example, that in 2014, a member of the parliament of, of Jobbik, uh, Mr. Nagy, uh, gave a speech in front of the uh, Council of Europe wearing a T-shirt saying that Transcarpathia legally belongs to, uh, to, to Hungary. So I think it is related with the fact that they saw in the, um, in the, in the invasion of uh, Crimea, in the annexation of Crimea, a window of, of opportunity for expressing uh, their own uh, territorial expansionism. Thank you. We do have a question from the audience, please. Yes. Can you use the microphone, please? Thank you. Or the other one, yeah. I'm Olga Kosmidou. I'm a retired director general of the European Parliament, and I want to react to what Mr. Shufflin has said. 
that's for sure that uh, extreme right parties like Jobbik can do a lot of harm if they work closely together with uh, Russia. But uh, there are a lot of us considering that attacks to the European Union coming from inside the European Union and especially from our political family, as it's often the case in Hungary, are doing even more harm. Uh, when we see, for example, the Prime Minister of Hungary going to Bulgaria to try to attract help to sabotage uh, decisions taken by the European Union and especially by our family, we wonder is Russia doing more harm or is it the European Go Union is going to implode from inside? Thank you. If the European Union does implode from the inside, I really don't think that Hungary will be can you, responsible. Yeah, can you use the mic? Sorry, I thought I put it on. I don't think that if the European Union is going to implode from the inside, I think Hungary is too small to do that. But you may think that Hungary is a wonderful and great country. Um, now, uh, the point you're making, I think, um, is that Hungary is doing serious damage, etc., etc. There's the migration issue, numerous other issues uh, in which I think Hungary does understand its own position as being uh, qualitatively different from that of the European mainstream and sees that particular perspective as deleterious to the welfare of Europe, for example, on migration, uh, and therefore takes a different position uh, and supports that. Let me draw your attention to the reality. A uh, very recent survey work done uh, in, I think, 11 for, uh, European countries show that in the V4 countries, opposition to migrants is around 80%, 80% plus, depending on which country you look at. I think it's highest in Slovakia. And the level of dissatisfaction with Brussels uh, is about the same. Now, if the European Union persists with compulsory quotas, there will be an upsurge of opposition. And I think it's better that the European Union rethink its project, rethink its remit, uh, rethink what it's about, than face uh, what I think will be a very unpleasant divisiveness. Um, and there's one final point I want to make here. We will all be aware, I imagine, uh, that uh, various voices are saying uh, the transfers of structural funds and cohesion funds should be made contingent on, dependent on these countries taking uh, migrants. The economic position of the V4 countries is improving. I think we probably still need the transfers, but if they weren't closed off, if they were cut, these countries would survive. They would certainly find sources of finance on the international bond market. Um, and I think at the same time they would then start introducing capital controls. So beware of what you ask for. Uh, it, the unintended consequences may actually turn out to be much worse than what you have. And one final thing, you are aware that 90% of the transfers made to any and all of the EU-11 countries return home. German industry would be very, very unhappy if those transfers of cohesion structural funds were cut. So I don't think it's going to happen, but you can dream on. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Thank you, Marta Barandi, uh, organization Promote Ukraine. Uh, I have a question to Anton. I um, am not sure whether you follow the discussion in the Dutch media space about the East Stratcom. Um, very short, the Dutch media and politicians are questioning the competence of East Stratcom um, and uh, want the European Union to shut it down. And the question is, what role do Dutch far right play in this uh, uh, shutting down? Thank you. Do we have any other questions? So maybe we collect a few. Yes, please. Hello, uh, Artem Remzo Tseps. I have a question about um, the Russian, uh, the Russian far right, because we actually know that uh, there is still a position in terms of far right movement in Russia. Of course, it's suppressed by Putin's regime. So I wonder, uh, are, do others supported by the 
uh, far right, uh, any other far right movements in Europe. So my question basically is, is far right movement in Europe completely pro Kremlin or not? And Nicholas, you had a question. Hi, thanks. Nicholas Novaki, Martin Center. Um, just a question to Anton. I mean, you out outlined the problem uh, quite well, and you outlined the, 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 the links that exist between uh, Russia and the uh, European far-right parties. But my question is, what can uh, be done next to, to counter these links? And, and uh, Mr. Shefflin also uh, like, uh, highlighted the fact that Russia is actually quite often exploiting uh, existing weaknesses within Europe. So what can perhaps be done to kind of mend uh, these existing weaknesses? Thank you. Anton, would you like to, to address the questions? Yes. Um, well, unfortunately, I haven't heard of these Dutch attacks on, on Stratcom. Um, so it would be very difficult for me to comment on this. As for the Dutch far right, um, if we were talking about Mr. Wilders, and if we are talking about his uh, Freedom Party, it is well, the, the, the Dutch case is quite interesting because the the Dutch MEPs or Dutch uh, Dutch politicians from from the Freedom Party, they were not uh, noticed that they were not uh, really engaged in 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 open pro Kremlin efforts um, since I would well t until I would say 2017. Then something changed. I have no idea what changed. But Wilders recently visited Moscow, gave a, uh, an interview to, to RT, and he was in the Russian parliament. Actually, he was, he was meeting the same Leonid Slutsky, who is now coordinating part of the fake electoral observation of the presidential elections in, in Crimea. Um, so this is something to watch this is something this in 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 contrast to the cases such as front national or the freedom party of austria or the lega nord uh, the northern league in italy the the dutch case is still quite it's quite opaque it's it's quite vague we i don't know what is going on there as for the Russian far right, well, essentially we can we can divide the Russian far right into two large groups, no, into three large groups. The first group would be the far right, which is disloyal to the Kremlin, that is anti-Putin. Yeah, uh, it is essentially suppressed. It's the this this uh, camp of the Russian far right. It because because not because uh, they were so much anti-Putin, but because they were most extreme in their in their activities. They the the authorities, the police, have been suppressing them since 2008. So at this moment, this movement uh, does not really exist. I mean, it is insignificant. It is really insignificant. The second group uh, that I would mention are the groups that were initially part of this anti-system far-right movement in Russia, but decided not to come out as as, criti as, as uh, critical towards towards the Kremlin. They decided to either be neutral or to support the Kremlin, especially after 2014, especially after Crimea and Donbass. And so these people, they do exist. They do exist. Uh, and the third large part is essentially far right, which is part of the Putin system itself. Uh, Zhirinovsky uh, is the leader, Vladimir Zhirinovsky is a leader of the party, the far right party, the extreme right party, I would say, which is misleadingly called Liberal Democratic Party of Russia. Yevgeny Fyodorov, for example, who is a member of the, of the United Russia Party, at the same time, he's the leader of the so-called National Liberation Movement, which is a ex right-wing extremist movement. So these three large groups um, of the far right, uh, I would say that the, the, the second and the third are the largest now, since the anti-Putin movement is almost destroyed. Not only far-right anti-Putin movement, but also the liberal democratic movement, uh, which would be very critical of the Kremlin, is also almost non-existent. Um, 
but uh, also i wouldn't say no that not ev not everybody on the far right in europe is pro kremlin and usually it has to do with some historical issues uh, the far right in the baltic states the far right in romania and in poland in general they would be very skeptical of moscow well, especially, of course, in, in, in Ukraine, uh, the far right would be very much anti-Kremlin. Anti but if we're talking about the European Union, it is almost always history that determines the relations between uh, nationalists in the European Union and Russia. Um, also in Sweden, for example, the, the, uh, the relation or the attitudes towards uh, Russia, on the part of the far-right party, the Sweden Democrats, is very uh, controversial. Uh, they don't really want to have to have anything to do with Russia. As for what can be done, um, while I agree and I also argue in 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 my book uh, that it is the weaknesses of Western democracy that invites that invite russia to interfere and to do something <clears throat> it is still very important that um, something has to be done against the these immediate threats so we should think about how we can rebuild or you know revive democracy or strengthen democracy and it should be like there is a short-term task there are mid-term tasks and there are long-term tasks so if uh healing the wounds of the western democracy is a mid-term and long-term uh, agenda then trying that that then raising awareness of the uh, undermining influence of russia this is the short term the short term perspective this is a short term uh, agenda and i think it should it should start with uh, investigating the financial links uh, probably links uh, that would um, give us a hint about probably political corrupt about probable political uh, corruption of uh, European political forces, etc., etc. So, you know, strengthening the already existing mechanisms in the European Union regarding uh, external political funding and external political influence. So, this is this is all about it. Thank you, Anton. Antonis, maybe uh, would you like to add something to the question, are all European far-right parties pro-Russian? Not necessarily, but most of them yes, but not all of them. Uh, there are exceptions, for example, in countries where anti-Russian feelings are related with uh, historical uh, connotations, let's say uh, Latvia or something, or the Baltic countries in general. Uh, but in most other cases, I would say yes, that most uh, far-right parties are pro-Russian. And to add to what, to what Mr. Soflin uh, said before, it is true that in many cases, many far-left European parties are also pro-Russian. Uh, in some cases, they can, they, they can be even more pro-Russian than far-right. Yeah, it, it, it can happen. It is possible. And we, can, we observe that not only in the European Parliament, but also in cases of uh, electoral processes like a referenda and so on where foreign observers are invited by by the kremlin in some cases we see uh, far less politicians uh, participating in this uh, in observing these uh, elections thank you yes of course if you can use the mic please it's this question of of history now Hungary has actually been invaded by Russia four times in its history. I lived through two of those. So at that point, why has Jobbik had this uh, Tango Noir, Chardash Noir, uh, Trepak with Russia? I don't know. Um, it seems to me that you need the negative case uh, to understand why the, the, the far right, uh, history far right, and Russia, or how they are connected, what the causal nexus is, and why Hungary is, is the exception in that case. Well, well <clears throat> I will shortly comment on that. Well, Hungary is a very curious case in 
in many perspectives, you know, and also <laughs> not only about the uh, pro-Russian uh, Hungarian far right. So uh, I will just add about on um, the question about oh, are all the European far right parties are pro-Kremlin? There was a very odd case. Um, the, the, there was this party, I think it, it still exists, uh, it's called Romania Mare, the Greater Romania Party, which was led by Vadim Tudor, he is now, he, he is now dead for a couple of years, uh, but he, as far as I remember, he was the member of the European Parliament. And on all, on all resolutions that were critical of Russia, he voted for, he supported all the resolutions. Because of this, you know, Romanian nationalists cannot really be pro-Russian. But then something happened. Then uh, reports in the media started to appear that Russia was supporting the far-right parties with money. In most cases, that was sensationalism. It was just, you know, uh, people heard about the Front National case, so maybe Putin is just walking around Europe and giving money to the European far-right. So Vadim Tudor was reading all that stuff, and suddenly he started to be pro-Russian. That didn't really help him uh, because the, the Greater Romania Party did not really receive any support from the Russian side. But I think that was a very interesting turn of events. Uh, Romanian nationalists uh, decided to, to become pro-Russian because probably Russia is giving away money. Thank you for that comment. We'll be uh, collecting the last round of questions from the audience. So if anyone has a question. Yes, question in the back. Can we have the microphone, please? Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Lukiana Suvorov. I uh, represent the organization Creative Diplomacy. We are studying and focusing on public diplomacy of Russia. And uh, I have a question to you. Don't you think that uh, this uh, situation is a reaction of the lack of uh, uh, any contacts, official contacts between uh, official EU and uh, official uh, Russia delegation? Because uh, if uh, agree on contacts with uh, far rights, uh, we see it uh, many times as uh, far rights not like they don't like Russia so much or they don't like Russian politics so much, but they just make it in, in contrast because uh, many times uh, far rights uh, political parties they make something against mainstream in general. And from the opposite side, uh, Russia start to develop contacts with uh, far rights because they are the only contacts that uh, they have now in Europe. Anybody else uh, want to, to speak in a respectful way? So uh, don't you think that uh, in case to uh, stabilize the situation because uh, development of far rights organization is not good for Europe and Russia doesn't want in, in our opinion to, to destroy European integrity or unity. Uh, isn't, uh, would, wouldn't it uh, be better to, to start a kind of uh, official, uh, official programs, uh, official uh, contacts and uh, official meetings? Because many times what we know now about Russia is just our interpretation and media information, but not uh, real contacts. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Are there any more questions? No. Then we'll give the floor back to the panel to comment on this uh, last question. So is the lack of official contact <coughs> the reason for the contact with the far right? Maybe we will start with uh, yeah, you, Anton. Well, two points here. First, is that uh, many of the increasing contacts uh, between Russian actors, uh, which are either part of the regime or close to the regime of Mr. Putin, uh, they were developing indeed in response to the uh, lack of communication uh, with the mainstream politicians. It is, however, important to understand that this lack of contact with mainstream politicians was underpinned by the increasing, um, by it was it was underpinned by the by the desire of many of the mainstream politicians to justify Russia's actions, both domestically and internationally. Uh, 
it was very difficult for well first the west ignored everything what russia was doing it was ignoring what was russia uh, what russia was doing in chechnya during two chechen wars <coughs> it was ignoring a huge a huge violations of human rights in chechnya and in some other countries the west was ignoring completely ignoring what was going on transnistria Russia had to withdraw its its uh, its forces, its military forces from Transnistria already in the, at the end of the 90s. It did nothing like that. It went unpunished. So Russia was doing many things that gradually led to a situation where less and less mainstream politicians in the West wanted to talk to Russia. Why would you talk to a country that is promising something? and it's not keeping their promise. Um, the second point, so I would say, well, I, to conclude this, this, the, this first point, I would say, I think everybody on this planet, all the countries on this planet, is uh, interested in having good cooperation, good relations with Russia. The problem is not uh, that we, we somehow hate Russia, or we hate Russian people. No, it's not about that. It's about the it's about the international rules. It's the it's about the international norms. It is not possible to close our eyes and to ignore violations of human rights, of territorial integrity of other countries, and just go to back to business as usual. This has to stop. And and fortunately, I think it it has already stopped. Uh, the second point, very briefly is that Russia started to develop those contacts with the, with, with the Western far right when everything was quite okay uh, in relations between Russia and, 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 and the West. That was in 2004, 2005. Uh, Russia was still enjoying uh, good contacts with, uh, with the Western leaders, with Gerhard Schroeder, uh, later with Nicolas Sarkozy, then uh, with uh, Silvio Berlusconi. But still, there were contacts developing between Russian actors close to the regime with the activists on the far right. So it's not, it's not really in response. Of course, yes, some of the things were created in response, but Russia, Russian actors developed those contacts in sometimes independently of the official for relations, uh, foreign relations between Russia and the West. Thank you. Anton, would the other speakers like to add something to that? Yes. I think it also goes uh, the other way around. I mean, far-right parties in Europe uh, are trying to establish cordial relations with uh, Moscow, with Russia, in order to boost their credibility uh, in their own... Uh, uh, countries. For example, they pay official visits to Russia, they appear on state-owned uh, Russian media. Uh, this, in, ma in some cases, it might, give, uh, it might give them some sort of credibility inside their own countries. So it goes the other way around as well. Thank you. Mr. Shopling? Yes, thank you very much. So, f should there be contacts or uh, enlarged contacts between uh, Russia and the West. Well, obviously the embassies are still there. Uh, the possibility of communication uh, is still there. But it seems to me that in the light of Crimea and the Budapest Memorandum, uh, Russia is in very serious breach of its international obligations. And if Europe wants to undermine its own credibility, it will get back into this uh, romance with Russia. Um, I don't know to what extent the European Union has understood what a failure uh, its close partnership with Russia has been. Uh, but maybe they do, so maybe there is reluctance to re-engage. I can only support this. And also you have to ask the question, well, does Russia actually want to talk more closely to the European Union? European Union, much less so. Europe, I think it wants to talk to individual states and split them off, obviously. Uh, Germany is, is absolutely key. And finally, just want to add, in my own experience, these international get-togethers are quite unbelievably boring. 
Well, thank you. We are a few minutes earlier, but I think we can close the discussion. Thank you, panelists, for your insights. So I would like just to give you three take takeaways, which according to me are important from this discussion. So I guess we can all agree that uh, starting from 2004, from the call of the revolutions, uh, Russia uh, has been bringing forward an institu institutionalized cooperation with the far right involving gongos in electoral observation and also um, rebranding Russia to Today and, and making it an international media platform. Um, it's not only the far right who is pro-Russian in Europe, but also the far left. This is something that we should focus on as well. And uh, the West does recognize Russia as an important player. However, uh, international law cannot be ignored. So uh, thank you very much once again to the panel and thank you to the audience for coming. If just two remarks, if you can please fill in our evaluation form after the event. And um, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of uh, Anton's book, we do have a few copies. You can approach our colleague Milda at the exit. Thank you very much once again. Thank you.